welcome to On Trial, starring Mark Radlich. Also starring Sean Comer. Hope you're ready, Hollywood, because you're on trial. All rise, court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Fudge presiding. This is On Trial, brought to you by the Rattler Gym Broadcasting Network. Tonight, I am your defense attorney, Mr. Mark Rattledge, and uh, prosecuting Scooby-Doo, Monsters Unleashed, the 2004 American live-action slash computer-animated family horror comedy film, at least that's what Wikipedia tells me, <coughs> is Sean Comer. How do you do, sir? I'm Sean, you're not, and I perpetually look forward to offending you all. <laughs> so, this week here on the Rattle and Broadcasting Network is entitled Motley Crew and Scooby Doo Two. Why we put those two together? Why the fuck not? Um, no, it uh, <laughs> it happened to be because uh, Motley Crew released their biopic on Netflix uh, the twenty second, so we decided to cover uh, cover that you know the soundtrack and the movie, uh, but also but you know there was no comic book you know to, to lend itself to so we gave the other half of the week to um some folks that wanted to talk about a comic book that i didn't have any interest in but uh this it also happened to be after i got back from uh spring um, my spring break cruise so uh jesse and company took on scooby-doo apocalypse and i thought you know what would be fun to do one of the Scooby-Doo movies, and I figured, you know, the sequels are usually worse than the original, um, so I kind of picked it cold. Uh, I also thought the, the the title of it itself seemed interesting, um, seeing as whether you know you you think the movie is bad or good or indifferent. Um, either way, the movie did such they decided to not do a third one and instead of reboot the whole damn thing. Matthew Lillard be damned. But uh, so that's what we're going to put on the docket tonight. Scooby Doo Two: Monsters Unleashed, and then you can go listen to some Motley Crew and figure out what. I have to ask. I have to ask. Um, were you as surprised as I am to learn that for all their fame and all the larger than life bombast, that Motley Crew have in fact never had a comic book? Um. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I didn't think too much too much about it. I also didn't look that. For the, <laughs> I also didn't look that hard for it either. Um, <laughs> I have to tell you, the, the Scooby Doo uh, uh, source material was on the calendar well before the dirt was. Um, but uh, so here we are. And now, had you seen either of the live action Scooby Doo movies before uh, I opted to throw this on the schedule? You know what? I had seen the first one released in two thousand two. I saw it in theaters. In fact, that was back when. Oh, God, Alexis and I had been dating for about two years at that point. Um, so, yeah, I think she dragged me out to that for a date night one evening. I was going to say, uh, she's a passionate cartoon fan, and, you know, um, so I'm wondering, did she burn the theater down when it was over? I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say burn it down. I think she was decidedly amused. I seem to remember, and I could be wrong about this, and I'd say I'd feel bad if I was, but fuck it, no, I won't. Um, I think she ended up buying it on DVD, actually. Really? Like, like actually paying legitimate dollar dues for it. So I had seen the first one, and for reasons I will kind of get into over the course of the evening, I I surprisingly enjoyed it. I had never seen this one though. I I just couldn't be arsed. <laughs> so. This is this is one off the off the bucket list, and I'm trying to I'm trying to calculate roughly how far down the bucket list see Scooby Doo Two Monsters Unleashed ranked. <laughs> <laughs> well, we lucked out on this one um, because sometimes I pick things without really with regard <clears throat> for where I can find a copy of the movie. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I I don't mind paying for them here and there to sort of add to the. 
<coughs> add to the uh, movie collection in my digital movie collection. Another time, it's like, eh, um, you know, I, I will rent them because I can't imagine I'm ever going to watch these again. This one turned out it was on Netflix. I I, mm-hmm. I I was looking for stuff to to watch while I was on the cruise. I watched The Get Down, uh, which I really enjoyed, by the way. I highly recommend it if you're at all interested in the uh, late seventies rise of hip hop, um, or the, uh, the the DJ culture of the I Bronx. Am. But um, yeah, the get the Get Down on the two seasons of the Get Down on Netflix. I was really into, and I watched. <laughs> Because I've seen, uh, I'd seen commercials of it when I go to the movies. The Tracy Morgan uh, TNT sitcom, I guess you could call it that. Uh, the Last OG, I watched that as well. And so I'm flipping around Netflix, downloading stuff to you know, to watch on my cruise. And I happen to have noticed, I'm like, holy crap, Scooby Doo Two's on here. Well, <laughs> that worked out well. All right, as we've been saying all week, Sean, give me the dirt. Scooby Doo Two Monsters Unleashed is a movie. Yeah, it was filmed with it was filmed with cameras. <laughs> it features actors. Uh, whether or not you wish to count Matthew Lillard in there, reasonable people may differ. That is arguably the most controversial aspect of this movie. <laughs> um, also, if you have ever sat back and asked yourself, you know. Other than Guardians of the Galaxy and Slither, what has James Gunn done? Now you know. This is in fact written by the fut- by the future helmsman of Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, it was greenlit pretty damn quickly when the live action Scooby Doo kind of blew up bigger than really just about anybody expected at the box office. It it didn't draw critical raves, but the thing you have to remember about it is this movie came along at a time when Scooby-Doo was seeing this kind of interesting, bankable revival at Universal among younger audiences. Um, this was around the time when it was kind of being retooled for both TV and direct-to-video movies. It was finding a whole. It was finding a whole new crowd, and among adults, it was kind of a warmly cherished cult favorite. As much for the giddy, happy Saturday morning memories as for the, you know, obvious rampant stoner culture reveal. And. You know, all, all things considered, in, in terms of its box office, box office success, mixed bag, opened March 26, 2004, and on a $25 million, million dollar budget, uh, it managed to gross barely its money back, uh, $29.4 million over 3,312 theaters, average of 8888 um, during its opening week, during its opening weekend, that was good enough to top the box office. By the time its theatrical run was over, it had grossed a combined eighty-four point two million in North America and a surprising total one hundred eighty-one point five million internationally. Um, which, believe it or not, was still over ninety million dollars less. Than the two hundred seventy-five point seven million that Scooby Doo raked in around the world two years earlier, it ended two thousand four as the twenty-eighth most successful film. So it's a slight feather in its cap. Six highest grossing fe- grossing film featuring a dog as a major character, and when it released in the UK on April second, two thousand four. Uh, it also topped the box office air for the next three weekends running before it was eventually dethroned by Kill Bill Volume 2. <clears throat> More recently, if you were to mosey on over to Rotten Tomatoes, uh, film currently holds a rating of 22% based on 117 reviews, averaging 4.3 out of 10. Um, over on CinemaScore... Audiences gave surprisingly gave the film an A minus on an A plus to F scale, uh, which actually ranked it higher than the B plus 
achieved by its predecessor. <coughs> Excuse me a second. Hmm. I'm sorry, folks. I'm getting over a bit of a bug. I'll, I will try to mute the mic when I need to cough. Um, but bringing it back around again, full circle to the disappointment, it won a 2004 Razzie for worst remake or sequel. And there it is, guys. That is pretty much the dirt on Scooby Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed. All right. Uh, full disclosure I've watched this twice and watched as a bit of an overstatement. Twice? Really? Watched as a bit of an overstatement. Um, so, wait, I, you, did, did you actually watch this while you were on vacation and you were supposed to be having fun? No. Uh, I watched it last night, proceeded to sleep through the whole thing. Oh, And okay. then took another crack at it today. <laughs> and now, yeah, no. uh, um, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I, I watched it this afternoon while Carrie was at a work thing and the kiddo was at school. Um, when said kiddo got home, she had a good hearty laugh when I informed her that I had to watch this for a podcast. Well, I watched it with my son, who will be five next month, and he really liked it. See, in, 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 our, in our house, it's a 14 year old. Bit of a difference. Um, <laughs> but the almost five year old and the eight year old, uh, the, I think the eight year old gave up on it when I did not off at one point, and uh, she just you know, gave up trying to keep me awake. But I made it through 90% of this movie <laughs> awake. Uh, the reason why I bring that up is normally I don't read word for word the, the Wikipedia uh, summary, but I'm kind of have to because, believe it or not, <laughs> I, I, I want to make sure I get to some of the details here, and I'm not kidding when I tell you some of the details of this movie were escaping me. So... <laughs> I don't know what that's. You know what? I don't know what that says, what? but I I don't hold that against you. I'm sure that if you were to put a gun to my head and ask me to recall an in depth plot analysis right now, I don't think I could come up with a whole lot without probably mixing up things that happened in the first movie and things that happened in this one. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I if I had to, I could kind of bare bones get from you know point A to point Z, but you know it, it would. Fred, Daphne, Velma, Shaggy, and Scooby-Doo attend the opening of an <laughs> exhibition at the Coolsonian Criminology Museum commemorating their past solved cases with monster costumes on display. However, the celebrations are interrupted by a masked man known as the Evil Masked Figure who steals two costumes using the reanimated pterodactyl ghost. The gang are ridiculed by journalist Heather Jasper Howe who starts a smear campaign against them. Concluding an old enemy is the mastermind, the gang revisit old cases, dismissing the former pterodactyl ghost, Jonathan Jacobo, due to his death during a failed prison escape. They guess that Jeremiah Wilkles, the Black Knight ghost portrayer, and Jacobo's cellmate in prison, is the culprit. Going to Wilkles' mansion, the group fall through a trapdoor into a cage targeting unwelcome callers, but escape with the aid of Daphne's cosmetics, Inside, the gang find a book that serves as an instruction manual on how to create monsters. Monsters! Shaggy and Scooby-Doo find a note inviting Wickles to visit the Faw Ghost Nightclub. They are attacked by the Black Knight Ghost, but escape when Daphne fights him off while Velma discovers its weak spot. She kicks him in the balls! You understand. Right in the nuts! Before fleeing, the rest of the gang had previously discovered through... The book found in Wickles' mansion that the key ingredient to creating monsters was a substance called randomonium. <sighs> randomonium. Which can be found at the old silver mining town. You know, where, where they mine the randomonium next to the coal. Make America great again. Anyway. And the and the, un and the unobtainium. Yes. And the adamantium. Yes, and the vibranium. It's all right there in West Virginia. Oh, yes, lest we forget the vibranium. <laughs> um most important substance on earth and they make a frisbee out of it anyway <laughs> uh, shout out to you Ultron you were gone before your time Daphne, Velma and Fred go to the museum accompanied by the curator Patrick wisely but discover that the rest of the costumes have been stolen Heather Jasper Howe turns the city against them the gang go to the mines find Wickle's plan to turn it into an amusement park as you will want to do 
Uh, as they confront Wickles, he states that he and Jacobo were cellmates who hated each other and that he has no connection to the museum robberies. Shaggy and Scooby, after overhearing the rest of the gang criticizing the tendency to bumble every operation, and especially their most recent offense in failing to secure the pterodactyl ghost at the museum, resolve to better themselves and become real detectives by putting on different clothes. Okay, that last part I added, but that's really what happens. Following the lead from Wickle's note, uh, the first clue ever, they sneak into the Faw ghost wearing disguises to try and solve the mystery. After speaking to Wickles, they hear how he has mended his evil ways. Scooby causes the scene and his disguise falls off, and the two must escape through a trash chute. On their way out, they spot Patrick uncharacteristically assaulting someone who appears to be a member of his staff, ordering him to find answers as to who vandalized the museum. Escaping an awkward interaction with Patrick, Shaggy, and Scooby, spot Wickles leaving the club and follow him. The gang find the monster hive where you always find it, in a swamp, where the costumes are brought to life as real monsters. Shaggy and Scooby play around with the machine's control panel, bringing several costumes to life, and the gang flees with the panel as the evil mass figure terrorizes the city. Escaping to their old high school clubhouse, the gang realize they can reverse the control panel's power by altering its wiring, like you do. Captain Cutler's ghost emerges from the bayou, forcing the gang to head back to the mines. Encountering the various monsters along the way, Velma sees Patrick in the mines, finding a shrine dedicated to Jacobo built by Patrick, but Patrick proves his innocence by helping them, Velma <coughs> not fall to her death. The gang confront the evil mass figure as the tar monster captures all of them, but Scooby, who uses a fire extinguisher to freeze the tar monster's body as if he is Iceman from the X-Men. <laughs> He reactivates the control panel, transforming the costumes back to normal. The gang takes the evil mask figure to the authorities, unmasking him as Heather. When asked why Heather did what she did, Velma then suddenly pulls and peels Heather's face off, revealing she's actually Jacobo in disguise. <coughs> Jacobo had survived the fall from the prison wall and sought to get revenge, revenge, on the sleuths by discrediting them. Jacobo's cameraman, Ned is also arrested as an accomplice. The sleuths are praised as heroes in Coolsville, in the fall goes, the gang celebrates the victory with reformed criminals. Da 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 da. All right, the prosecution will take the stand. So let's begin by dispelling one of the classic and really utterly mystifyingly false beliefs about TV to screen adaptations. And that's the idea that these adaptations are just all of them uniformly bad. They're terrible ideas. They should never, ever be attempted. This is not true. It is entirely possible, just as it is with any medium, to take some source, mater some source material, be it a video game, be it a TV show, comic book, novel, what have you, and put an interesting cinematic spin on it and make it something that's legitimately enjoyable for around 90 minutes to two hours. It's been done before. Beverly Hillbillies captured everything that was charming and endearing about the original series. Uh, the first Brady Bunch movie lovingly deconstructed the show's most famous cheesy tropes by dragging the family kind of awkwardly retro corny motifs and aesthetics and values and all into a modern setting and not really trying to change them up but just just having a good old time watching the the dissonance with modern trappings and grit uh, the, the Dukes of Hazard perfectly cast it was an absolute love letter to everything that gave the original show such a such a cult guilty pleasure staying power um, it, it really was like just a a, a, a two uh, almost a, a a lost two hour episode of the original series just with you know an age appropriate cast uh, Get Smart was a shockingly fun action packed update on the TV series uh, Adam's Family enough said if, if you've seen it you know 
every inch why that why that first movie was such a hit, why it's still beloved today, why it holds up so well. It is everything you could want from two hours of a timely cast bringing the Adams family family to life. Um, in fact, I would dare say it is probably the uh, the standard bearer still for TV to screen adaptations. And <clears throat> allow me to give the 2002 movie ample credit. It was legitimately fun. Um, much like the Brady Bunch, it deconstructed everything that you kind of hold dear and it had some fun it had a certain unique self-aware fun with the original with the original materials shallow tone by taking it into uncharted waters it starts the movie off by with kind of lovingly taking the piss out of out of each character's personality by having the gang break up and having them sniping at each other a little each other a little bit and building the entire movie around reconciling them and actually getting them back together and you can tell watching just about every single scene of it that the cast is just having a grand time bringing these characters to life as four people and a dog that are they're sort of out of their out of their comfort zone and out of their time and it's one of the few positive things that I can also say about this movie. And that is, you can tell watching it, that each of the actors still really gets what they're, try, what they're trying to do here. And basically, they're living it up in pricey-ish, studio-funded cosplay. As, 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 these, as these four meddling kids. Um... They they are really just digging in to just being Scooby, Fred, Velma, and Daphne. And by the way, while I'm at it, I also have to give ample credit to Seth Green because any time you see the man in anything, he never looks like he is having anything less than the time of his life. Almost no matter what he, whether he's whether he's in Idle Hands or he's Scott Evil or um, <clears throat> or Oz on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, if he's you know if, whether it's the God canceled way too soon Greg the Bunny, I, he just always looks like like there's nowhere else and no other part he would rather be playing. It's kind of the same reason why I love to watch. Um, yep, my guys. Guys, get the drinks. Been a while. Been a month or so. Get ready to take a drink. The same reason why I love watching The Rock or Rowdy Roddy Piper act in anything. Because even if the material is absolute shit, they're determined to just amuse themselves. <laughs> that was not just me playing along with the drinking game. That's the fact that my throat is dry right now. <laughs> but... Unfortunately for all of that, here's where a sequel, while they knew it would be profitable, was A, unnecessary, and B, ill-advised. Because, really, you were never going to come up with a better angle for a Scooby-Doo movie than the way you did the first one. Because it was a fresh take on it. It was, it was a fresh, self-aware self-aware just kind of loving roast of a of a childhood saturday morning favorite and with this one it feels too often like they're trying to go back to almost that exact same well because in this case you've got the gang that's all together they're working as a unit but at the same time they're everyone is trying a little bit too hard to Develop or advance each each character of the gang because they're all kind of at various points questioning what their role is in the group and 
trying to be more like somebody else, whether you're talking about Scooby and Shaggy deciding that they want to be more serious detectives like Fred and Velma, or Velma deciding that she would really rather emulate Daphne so that she can get the guy. It misses... It misses the fact that half the fun of the original show was each character just kind of embracing the stock DNA. You know, you, you've you've got the, the the pretty damsel in distress, the you know kind of homely looking homely looking nerd, the stoner and his happy go lucky loyal dog, the jerk in the ascot. And it, it was it was dependable. It was reliable. You kind of always came, always came back to it, and you knew exactly what to expect. The thing is, when you try to develop each of these a little bit too hard, you veer away from the fun of everything that kind of makes Scooby Doo Scooby Doo. And all of a sudden, it's going to try to be a, a little, just a little bit too existential at times, as weird as it sounds to attach that adjective to Scooby fucking do. Um, in the first movie, when it ended up, you still, you kind of had the notion of everybody kind of becoming okay with who they were, but also realizing, I can still be this, but I can also be this too. Um, but in this, that that just kind of gets rammed down everyone's one's throats to the point where it just becomes utterly joyless, which is sad because it's one of the rare times I can say that one of the that Matthew Lillard has been one of the best parts of a movie he's been in because he he once more is just a a total scenery chewing Casey Kasem stand in. Uh, he, he's another one who is just having an utter blast from start to finish acting opposite this CGI dog. And all credit where it's due for that. It's, it's got some kind of fun action sequences. The, <laughs> the, the bit with Scooby skateboarding a fire extinguisher around, around a room and kind of TKOing every classic Scooby-Doo monster he comes across as they've now all been resurrected. I, it was out of nowhere. It was batshit nanners. It was basically like watching Yoda do his little goddamn uh, Olympic gymnastics routine all around the room in uh, Attack of the Clones. But you know, ultimately... Like, like I said, it, it misses some of the... And again, intelligence and Scooby-Doo should almost never be used in the same sentence. But it misses that self-aware wit that kind of made it so much fun to be in on the joke with the first movie. It's... The, the effects are decent. It was, it, it was a cool little premise to take all these classic monsters and or all these classic costumes, I should say, and have them brought to life as as real monsters. That was kind of clever. But otherwise, it's a, it's a forgettable, lazy ass cash in that doesn't bother that doesn't bother to go to say, okay, here is this here's this fairly basic material I've been handed. What can I do with this that no one has touched on before? You know, like like the Brady like the Brady Bunch did, or how can I take every? I mean, it, well, I, I guess you could say it kind of tries to modernize a little bit in the style of Dukes of Hazard or Beverly Hillbillies, but not really enough so that any anything lands as being a completely fresh take. So I'm sure this is one that James Gunn would just as soon stay on the shelf for as long as possible. And with that, I turn the floor over to the defense. 
So not every movie is uh, created equal. Uh, not every movie is meant to be a you know Lord of the Rings theatrical masterpiece. Uh, but by the same ex- token, not every movie is The Room. Uh, there's a lot of space in between some of the worst movies ever and some of the best. <clears throat> and I get a little... I was talking about this on uh, the review of uh, uh, The Dirt. You know, um, you know the idea that... I'm oh, sorry, not the, the trailer reaction for Toy Story. That's where this came up. Toy Story 4. Which looks like a pilot, <coughs> by the way. Uh, that I, I don't I don't really buy into the idea of didn't we say all we needed to say with the first <laughs> um, you know I if a, if there's money to be made go make that money honey um, go go get them dollars just tell a decent story tell a fun story um, not every movie has to speak to the nature of man either sometimes. Uh, you put on a movie because you want to be entertained for 90 minutes. As a father of children, sometimes you put on a movie to entertain the children for 90 minutes so that you can get laundry done. Or you can watch an episode of Oz or something, you know, while they're distracted. Whatever. Whatever your your business is. Um, Scooby-Doo 2 is competently made, inoffensive, children's fair. To treat this like it's you know, some, you know, like you should be weighing it against terms of endearment or something, you know, that it needs critical analysis, I think misses the point. It's a love letter, to use the phrase that uh, the prosecution had uh, used earlier, it's a love letter to the cartoon. And the cartoon was pretty simple enough. There is a ghost. We have these kids that are investigating the appearance of said ghost. Turns out it's a dude in a costume who had some sort of plot, uh, nefarious plot. You know, it was scaring people off a plot of land or, um, you know, taking revenge on somebody who had wronged him. Fairly simple stuff. You had, uh, you had your genius, you had your, your hippie stoner, your comical dog for which the show is named, your damsel in distress, and your hero in an ascot. They were stock characters. The show produced some laughs. Occasionally they bring on a guest star like the Harlem Globetrotters or Batman or Don Knotts. D- Don Knotts. Like, if you're in the production meeting, you're like, like who haven't we gotten on this thing? <laughs> <laughs> who would resonate with the children? Fucking the Apple Dumpling Gang. Let's get the Don Knotts in there. The Harlem Globetrotters. Sure. I get it. Um, now- nowadays, you get whoever WWE can spare for a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, with that being said, this was harmless fun. And I, I'm all about craft. You know, I, I don't... I, I expect a major motion picture from Hollywood to be made competently, at a minimum. And if you can click that box, you're a winner in my book. You know, I mean, that, that, that may be a bar low for people, bar too low for people. But again, I'm not looking for art here. I'm look, I, I want to turn to make sure my kid is awake and is enjoying himself, and that's good enough for me. Um, Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed, I haven't seen the first one yet, but I watched this and I was like, oh, what? this is a fun idea. This is all the old, th- this is an homage to all the old monsters of the cartoon, and it was a fun take on them. It was like, oh, hey, these were, these were really one's costumes, but someone found a way to, by using magic, to animate them. Again, and again, it was right out of the cartoon. There was a revenge plot here. They, you know, they, they took it up a notch by doing the double mask thing. It's fun. All harmless fun. All, uh, I think, paying... The, this wasn't... La- the danger with a lot of these movies is that they tend to laugh at the source material. They tend to poke fun at it. They tend to undercut it. This is, this is celebrating the source material, which I think you know, lends uh, itself to, to the movie's favor that the producers of this, James Gunn and everything, really took care to say, no, 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 we like Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo is a fun, worthy thing, and we want to do justice by it. And I thought the movie actually does. I don't... I didn't look at this and think to myself, as I have with some other movies, like, oh, this is just an excuse to make dick jokes. You know, or this is taking the piss out of something. 
No, I just felt like this was a continuation of the same themes, the same um, the same fare that you got out of the Hannibal Barra cartoon. Uh, now, I talked about competency and craft. Uh, the CGI and special effects are a little wonky at times. I mean that that might be that that might take some of the Robert Winfrey's amongst you uh, out of the film. Scooby looks animated. <laughs> he's he's no Caesar. I'll tell you that much. I don't know, <laughs> but it was also 2004. I know we we we've, we've gotten you know we've gotten a lot better since then. But he, they, they didn't even make him look as realistic as Gollum, for that matter. So um, I could see I could see someone prosecuting the movie uh, for that aspect. But then again, do you want a super realistic Scooby? This is suppo- again, this is supposed to elicit. Uh, childlike enjoyment, and so I think the idea of him being a little cartoonish lends itself properly to uh, the cartoon. As for your live action cast, uh, Matthew Lill- Matthew Lillard brought Shaggy to life. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought that was Casey Kasem. He's excellent. You know, mm-hmm. I don't. I don't. Uh, th- this might be Matthew Lillard's best work. Quite frankly, he embod- you're getting no argument from me on that. He em- uh, he embodies this character from head to toe, and he looks like he's having a ball. And he's not doing he's not doing an impression of Shaggy. He's becoming the character. And you got to give credit where credit's due when when judging the film and reviewing it. If a character makes you believe and is and comes to life on screen, that's not something to knock or hold against the film. That's something in favor of it. Um, same can be said of Linda Cardinelli. Now, I understand that in the cartoon she's supposed to be a homely, you know, genius type gal. Um, you know, she's not supposed to be a heartthrob. And Linda Cardinelli is hubba hubba. Um, that being point, so- uh, point point of order, I am actually I am actually completely fine with her with her slightly different take on Velma. Well, that's the thing. Like, I I thought she was great. I, to me, she's the heart of the movie. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think she, while Matthew Lillard embodies uh, the Shaggy character and you know is super fun, I think she's the you know more more so than Scooby, who's sort of a side character in his own movie. Um, she really is the heart of this thing. She's its she's its center. She has the best arc, and I'm going to talk about arcs in just a moment. She has she has one of the best arcs of the whole movie. You know, you have this you know someone who's supposed to be playing homely. And uh, and shy and, and insecure, you know, and she finds her uh, her groove. She get she gets her groove, as it were, you know. By the end of the movie, she she finds that uh, that that inner strength to be herself and you know enjoy the full fruits of life, love and all. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we all want to enjoy some fruit? Anyway, um, so now I I, uh, I she's a very pretty gal. And she does a great job with the character, and I thought she got the finer points of the character, like down pat, you know, everything down to the use of the word jinkies. Um, the only two people I had a major problem with, and I, and I think you know it was a, a choice on James Gunn's part, and again, having not not and not having seen the first one, I'm not sure if this is more of the same, but I feel like they're in a, when they were in a writer's room, they were like, we have to come up with something for Fred and Daphne. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're not going to have a movie here <laughs> because they made, you know, like if you're going to cast uh, in 2004 Sarah Michelle Gellar in anything, you have to give her shit to do. So, mm-hmm. you know, she can't be the damsel in distress character that Daphne was in the cartoon. She gets to be, you know, Captain Marvel in this. Fine, fuck it, whatever. She does a, <laughs> she does a great job of being the female, you know, the female hero in this. Um... She has zero arc. She's about as flat as can be, but that's fine. What she's supposed to be is, again, the hero character. Um, Freddie Prince Jr. as Fred, he actually has a, f- a pretty fun arc in this. You know, he's you know he's the typical I've lost in my own fame, and I have to find my, my find my way back to my real self again and see what's really important in this world. I was reading some of the reviews, and they were like, oh, there's no plot to this, there's no arcs, you know, these characters are flat, and I'm like, like, three out of the five characters, and again, one of them's an animated dog, have full arcs. 
Mm-hmm. Full arcs in this movie. Like, what do you, you know, when when structuring a screenplay and coming up with a story, these are the things you want in your characters. I don't know what more you want out of them. Uh, so, yeah, I thought he did a really good job of portraying the character who has to find his way back to his true self. Um, I talked about the, the, the plot already. Uh, I really don't have a whole lot more to say. I mean, I... I thought, uh, like I said, it uh, it captured the spirit of the cartoon well enough, and I I really was expecting it to be a lot worse. When I picked this, it was the idea of this is going to be so bad. I'll, you know, we'll have a lot of fun picking it apart. And I'm like, and I watch this, and I'm like, it's fine. I think that's its the that's its that's its crime against humanity. It's just fine. Your witness. You know, I actually agree with the point that it's pretty much okay for a movie to be mediocre. You know, for it not necessarily to be something the caliber of Birdemic or The Room, but for it to not necessarily be up to par with Ben Hur or the God or The Godfather or you know the first even the first Avengers movie. That's all well and good. I get that. But on the other hand, there's also a certain mentality of anything worth doing is worth trying to do well. <clears throat> and the problem really comes when you look at both movies, you realize that someone as creative and fun and smart as James Gunn wrote both of them, the first movie was surprisingly good, and then you watch this, and it just feels like little more than a retread of what you, of exactly what they did in the first one. Um, it's kind of like how you watch all three Austin Powers movies. And you've got you've got the first one, surprising hit. You've got the second one, improved on the original, and then you've got the third one, which proceeds for the most part to just go back and just retread the exact same jokes that they've been making for two movies now. And looking at a movie and saying and saying oh it's for kids it's not supposed to be brain surgery that's one thing but you never want to make that an excuse for laziness. And in a lot of places this does indeed feel this does indeed feel lazy and which is a shame because it's again the idea of bringing the old costumes to life it's it's a nice premise but the thing is it comes off at times as looking cheap as not being quite as on point with a lot of its jokes as the first as the first one was um with sometimes even resorting to just just flat out slapstick without necessarily anything smart to underpin it, and it's a waste of a fine effort from all four from all four members of the cast too. I wanna, like I said, I want, Linda, I want to raise an objection to that. Okay, your target audience is young children. You make it too smart, you're you're going to lose them. I mean, the 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 trick with Pixar. Mm-hmm. Hey, let, let me let me break this down just real quick. The trick with Pixar has been, and, and why they're they're a billion dollar uh, company, and they have nine hits for every one miss, is they've figured out the algorithm of balancing something that is equally interesting to adults as it is to children, as opposed to Illumination, which is all lowbrow humor. <laughs> you know, it's so it's, well. <laughs> you see, I'm both glad and a bit regretful that you kind of brought that brought that up before I was about to get to that. Oh, sorry. That was my, my point of kind of bringing it up in general. Is the fact that there, there are so many times when you can make a good movie that's entertaining the kids, but it's also smart enough that the jokes land with adults as well, and they can, if not be outright entertained by it, at least be kind of amused while it's shutting the kids up. Uh, Disney, at their best among their animated classics, are 
often absolutely great about this. Um, my my personal favorite being some of Robin Williams' humor in Aladdin. Sure. You know, jokes that he was just improving off the top of his head that might as well have just been culled directly from his stand-up that typical eight or nine year old ain't gonna get. But on the but on the other hand, when it when it kind of hits dead center with the adults, I mean they may not they may not be able to care less about the rest of the story. But they were able to go, <laughs> damn, I love Robin Williams. Um so it was a little bit of a treat for them. And that was kind of what a few more of the in jokes in the movie. What what made them what balanced them so well was the fact that you didn't necessarily have to have watched the original series and kind of be sort of hip to the subtext to necessarily understand everything that was going on. But if you did, it just kind of enriched the experience. But overall, yes, it's it's inoffensive. Um, brief side note: it, anytime somebody pipes up about a remake or an update of something coming out, you did not be ruining my childhood. <laughs> Leave my childhood alone. Stop booty raping my childhood. Okay. If they mention something about feeling like their childhood is being assaulted, assume that that person had the worst fucking childhood in the history of <laughs> childhoods. If somebody making a movie out of a cartoon that you watched, you know something that something that number one is meant to be kind of a love letter to that show, but also does not exactly swipe the original completely out of experience. If they say, this is ruining my childhood, do go get fucked. <sighs> Your childhood sucked. I do not feel sorry for you, nor do I feel sorry for the adult decisions that you now probably should go and sit and feel sorry about. It's an update for a new generation. The source material still exists. It hasn't it hasn't gone away. Sit the fuck down. Shut the fuck up. This has been a public service announcement from Sean. Anyway. You know, it, it, was, it was an homage. It, it is what it is. It tried to go the Brady Bunch approach, and in the first movie, it worked. In the second movie, they were... Clearly out of idea, they were clearly out of ideas. So, I, so I mean, you know, it's the, the best way I could kind of I could kind of describe it would be like if say if you saw if you saw the Eagles original lineup when they were on their when they were on their one of their reunion tours. And they ended their main their main set by playing Hotel California, and then they and then they come out on stage for the on stage for the encore. They're all excited and everything, and then they decide that they're going to play Hotel California again, but this time with a mariachi band and kazoo's. First of all, I'm all in. Okay, 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 fine. Bad, bad example. <laughs> oh, let's see. Let me put this another way. <laughs> okay, it would be like if they if they came out on stage, played hotel, played Hotel California, but they decided they were going to just kind of flip a few verses, flip a few verses around, or maybe you know switch out a key change. Or maybe um, Joe Walsh decided he was going to play. He was going to play it with with a completely different model of guitar. Is uh, yeah, maybe slightly different sound, but it's it's still the same. 
is still the same thing. I stop short of calling this just overtly, unforgivably bad. It isn't. But on the other hand, if you've seen the first one, you've pretty much seen this one. And with that, I rest my case. A minor point of contention. The objection I raised was merely to say that doing what Pixar does better than any studio on the planet isn't easy. Um, it's it's it's. I would tell you it's very hard to do. I don't. I think this is why a lot of studios of Blue Sky, uh, DreamWorks, uh, mm-hmm. Illumination, all take another tact um, with with their uh, slate of movies because they they still haven't figured out the Pixar formula yet. Right. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy um, to find that sweet point to where you've got content that resonates both equally with adults and kids and and, and nothing goes over anyone's head. Uh, uh, and so, you know what? I'm glad you mentioned that, actually, um, in terms of studios, because one little self-correction I will make, I said this was from Universal. Um, blame, it on, blame it on a week of cold medicine, guys. Um, it was from Warner Brothers. Um, I, I, I remember that. Because for the longest for the longest time, Alexis had a running joke that she would always make whenever one of these movies would be brought up, and it was Warner Brothers just has two buttons in their office for whenever for whenever they're out of ideas, more Batman and more Scooby Doo. <laughs> That's funny. Um, He's not entirely wrong. <clears throat> I would tell you, wrong. I would tell you, as of late, the only one that I've really seen. You know, I just give you an example of I of I think the struggle here, and this is why like I'm very forgiving of a movie like this. Like I don't I don't need you to speak to me in an equal tone that you speak to my children. I'm this isn't for me. I get it, and I'm okay with that. Um, is you know like I remember seeing the, the Lego Batman movie, mm-hmm. which clearly was a children's movie. But the writers treated it like it was a love letter to longtime, you know, fat bearded forty year old yep. Batman fans. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm laughing hysterically, and my wife and kids are looking at me like I'm drunk. Oh. You know. Um, and you know what? This is this is me kind of kind of taking off the prosecuting attorney persona. The movie is not that bad. It's I I. I I wouldn't call it good. Mediocre is resoundingly mediocre is probably about where it belongs. Yeah. Um, but I, I get what you're saying because actually the, the Lego Marvel and DC superhero games are very much, are very much the same. Yeah. They're, they're clearly geared towards kids, but man, there are some deep cut references and characters in there. Yeah, that 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 you that I don't think you can appreciate if you're under the age if you're under the age of twenty two. Um, gosh, I can't. There was uh, I feel like in the uh, the Batman. Oh, we saw uh, Into the Spider Verse. Just to give you an example, you know, Into the Spider Verse. Um, was a very was a very layered and rich film. Alicia Pat Mullen, in which loved case it. it was a piece of trash. Absolutely loved it. Um, and you know there was a lot about it that I really liked. You know, my my daughter's takeaway from it was Spider Gwen. That you know that's who she glommed onto, and she thought she was the best part of the movie because you know my daughter is you know like an eight year old feminist. Um, <laughs> my, you know what my son's favorite part of that movie was the very end the end credit scene where uh where the two spider-men are arguing yep yep <laughs> well although you know what i think i probably liked that for an entirely different reason than he did because toward the end of that movie i was actually becoming one of my only disappointments was that they at no point injected spider-man 2099 yeah um. <laughs> so I I just point that out, bring that up to say you know the film speaks to obviously you know different uh, ages yeah. differently, um and it really does take a deft hand to try to figure out you know how to hit all hit all the quadrants equally. It's not an easy feat to do, and a lot of people fail at it, and they don't even try anymore. You know they kind of like we're successful with this, let's just stay with it because we're not successful trying anything else. Well, and uh, you it, know. I, I have to give both these movies credit for something. It's something that I was discussing with Carrie 
um, about um, we've been discussing it off and on for the past couple of weeks because we both had kind of similar, kind of mutually similar experiences uh, with a couple action movies recently. Uh, we went to go see um, Alita: Battle Angel, which is one of Car- I believe Carrie said it was the might have been the first manga she ever read. Um, I, of course, being new to manga and anime, I had never heard of it. She insisted it was great. I had a fantastic time, and I came out of that going, God damn, now I want to go read the books. And I think we had a kind of sort of similar experience maybe on her end when we got out of Captain Marvel because, of course, I was I was familiar with the character because I'm not a comic book aficionado but by the same but by the same token um you know I'm not completely ignorant of it either um so I was familiar with the character and somewhat of the arc and the origin and everything Uh, she came out pretty much pretty damn entertained and impressed by it I think maybe even enough so that I can maybe talk her in talk her into reading um you know the arc of Carol Danvers ascending from Miss Marvel to Captain Marvel, and that's what a good adaptation like this can do: is it can create enough of an atta- of a an association with you know fun and the characters that it makes somebody want to go out and check out the old stuff. And. I I granted I think the first movie I think the first movie did it better, but that's certainly what I kind of got the sense that Scooby Doo could kind of do is you know maybe somebody wouldn't go and want to watch the the classic '60s cartoons, but at the very least it'll maybe get a it'll maybe kind of nudge them toward wanting to check out some of the fairly successful updated stuff. Might get my my son likes the one with the wrestlers. That being said, <laughs> uh, I think we are ready to adjourn court and move on to plugs. Uh, there's no on trial in the month of April. However, we are bringing back... We are dusting off an old classic. We are bringing back Long Road to Ruin. Um, yes! And we're, we're doing this kind of like a the, the old uh, Saturday Night Special. You know, uh, the old logo that was like pink and yellow and it would spin... Um, you know, something along those lines. Or you might say, like, this is the break in the Saturday Night Live where they would bring you Saturday Night's main event. Long Road to Ruin is your new Saturday Night's main event. Um, with the Hellboy reboot coming up, we are going to do a Long Road to Ruin for the original, for the 2004 and 2006, is it? Yeah, 2008, sorry. The 2004 and 2008 Hellboy movies from uh, Guillermo del Toro. So, uh, that's going to be April 18th. Um, we will bring back on trial on uh, May 9th with the Three Musketeers. This was uh, suggested to us by our good friend Andrew Graham. And then uh, we'll be doing another Long Road to Ruin on May 23rd for the first two oh, sorry, John sorry. Wick movies. Sorry. Sorry. Why? Why are you whispering? Sorry. Oh, I'm I, I'm sorry. Carrie is in here, kind of relaxing with me for the for the end of the show, and um, I kind of accidentally nudged her in a way that kind of triggered her bad back a little bit. Ah. So I, I was saying sorry, 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 sorry. Um. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Um. So yeah, we'll be doing another long road to ruin for John Wick, because uh, and that is because of John Wick three Parabellum uh, in June. We've got a couple of back-to-back on trials. We've got one for Godzilla 1998 with Matthew Broderick. And then we've got one for X-Men 3 The Last Stand. And then I'm retiring this entire podcast because this is the whole reason I started it in the first place. Was I was like, you know what? I want to do Superman Returns and X-Men 3 because I didn't because yeah. I feel like I need to talk about them. And now we're done. Okay, I'm, I'm no. having a not sure if serious moment there. <laughs> no, I'm, jo- I'm joking. <laughs> um... But a, but, but a feature-length podcast discussing the merits of X-Men 3 was definitely an impetus for wanting to do this podcast in the first place. So we're finally oh, yeah. getting to it. Um, June 13th. Uh, July 
We've got uh, an on trial for Pulp Fiction. And that's uh, that's actually August 1st. I take that back. August 1st, on trial, Pulp Fiction. So that uh, that takes us up through the summer. Uh, meanwhile, here in the city, uh, yep. like I said, we've got Scooby-Doo Apocalypse, The Dirt, The Dirt Soundtrack. Uh, we've got some boxing this weekend. Alexander uh, Gravjik versus Dowdo Mumbe uh, on ESPN at 9 o'clock. Uh, you can join myself, Mr. Toxic Masculinity, Pat Mullen, and the host of uh, Damn You Hollywood, Robert Winfrey, as he will be pantsless and covered in goo uh, after having covered uh, Justin Gaethje versus, um, oh gosh, what's his name? Uh, Edson Barboza, which is supposed to be glorious, glorious violence. He's going to join us if he can wake up from his uh, self-induced coma. Uh, the following week, we've got uh, Plastic Man on the Lam, Dumbo, and finally, Children of Bodom Hex. And that's before I go see Shazam and then head off to New York for WrestleMania. All right, Sean, what do you got going on in your world? Uh, well, you know what? For the foreseeable future, this is actually going to be about the only place you guys get to hear from me. I will leave it all up to you to decide if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I am currently living in the new, actually fairly permanent uh, Fortress of Shamtude in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, however, before I can get back to streaming, we have got a little updating we've got to do with our living room before I can kind of do it up properly the way, the way that I like. So my streaming is going to be um, anywhere from intermittent to on hold entirely. Uh, if you would like to follow me or even subscribe in the meantime, twitch.tv slash Comer Codex. I am a variety streamer. I play a pretty wide wealth of stuff. I usually have a single player game go going at a given time, and I kind of mix that in with when it comes to multiplayer games, uh, particularly Overwatch, Dead by Daylight, and Injustice 2. Although, never know when I might add something else. Never know when I might throw some Warframe in there. Um, thinking about playing some Call of Duty Modern Warfare remastered pretty soon. But, hey, you got time because that's not going to be coming until the end of April. I am on a bit of a social media hiatus, actually. I yanked Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram off my phone because I needed a break from them. And to be honest, I'm not entirely sure they're ever coming back. Um... I, I kid, I kid. They will be, but just not anytime soon. So, um, if you absolutely can't get enough of me, uh, by all means, drop Mark a line. Let it, let him know that you love that saucy Sean Comer goodness, and you never know. Maybe I can turn it up on an episode of Metal Hammer of Doom, maybe Source Material. Um, since I'm getting out to more first-run movies lately, maybe even Damn You Hollywood sometime soon. But... Otherwise, no. Thank you, everybody, for, tune, for tuning in. As always, I appreciate it. And never dull your colors for someone else's canvas. All right, that's the end of our uh, On Trial podcast for this evening. Thank you for joining us. Be well, be safe. No, wait, no, it's 2019. We look forward to offending you in the future. <laughs>